Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is recorded in the 41st and 45th verses of the 19th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel. And when he, Jesus, was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought. My dear friends in Christ, it was the poet Cowper who once said, God made the country, man made the town. And I'm sure he meant to imply by that that there is something basically different between the rural and the urban areas. With God, of course, being more prominent in the life of the simple country and with man placing himself in the foreground in the life of the city. The man of the soil appears to be somewhat cleaner and godlier than the man of the city who is hemmed in on all sides by temptation and trespasses and evil influences. And now I'm sure that we realize there is much in Cowper's thought. The city and the country are different. And for us, that is especially emphasized as we read in the Gospels of the New Testament, the different woes and the denunciations which Jesus pronounced, especially upon the cities in which he practiced his ministry of mercy. It seems that there he met with least response to his gracious invitation to come and receive the gifts of God through his blood. His chief complaint against the cities was their lack of understanding and interest and their blunt refusal to accept his plea and his gift. And this was especially true of the beloved city of Jerusalem, the seat of culture and the seat of religion in the time and days of our Lord. Today the text and the gospel lesson brings us to the point where we see Jesus sitting on the hillside before his beloved city and meditating on the things that he knew in his omniscience about the town. And we're told that he wept. Naturally, our curiosity is aroused and we ask why. Why the tears of Jesus over Jerusalem? The tears of Jesus were shed first of all, over the city itself and over its people. Here was a place that had tremendous advantages over many another city of its day. And these advantages were pointed up particularly by the fact that the people of Jerusalem had every opportunity to know religious truth, for the great temple of God was located in Jerusalem. People came from hundreds, yea, thousands of miles around to inquire in matters of religion and to discuss their problems of religion. Here they could find an answer to the question, who is the true God? Here they were told about the promised Messiah who would come to redeem Israel and all mankind from its sin and from the curse of sin, death and damnation. Here, by chance, they might even meet Jesus on the street and be able to discuss a problem with him. This city certainly was favored. This holy city that saw the evidences of his many miracles that was with him so much and he with it so much. Truly, we would say it was a wonderful thing to be able to live in the city of Jerusalem. And still today, we're told that Jesus wept he wept at the sight of this wonderful city, and he wept because of its stubborn refusal to accept that which he was bringing to it. He wept also because he saw in his omniscience the total destruction of this great town that he knew so well. He looked beyond the glamour of her bright lights and her air of sophistication, and he saw deep down in the innermost recesses of her heart a spiritual blackness that even he, in his love and mercy, seemingly uh, could not dispel. 
Jesus saw in that people at Jerusalem, a disgusting spirit of self-sufficiency. This people was well taken care of economically. They were very active socially. They had many opportunities intellectually. And they were so satisfied finally with themselves and with their ability to provide for themselves that they had no heart and no ear for the message of their Savior, Jesus Christ, his doctrine of repentance and regeneration and reconciliation. And so because they were barricading the doors to heaven to themselves by their attitude, it's no wonder that Jesus' eyes overflowed with tears. But meditating more, Jesus pondered also their spirit of Phariseeism. This was the religious philosophy which taught was taught and lived by the temple leaders, a philosophy that said that by outward observance of moral and ceremonial and political codes, God's anger over against sin could be appeased and possibly his punishment averted. They said that as long as the outside of the cup was clean, it made little difference what the inside looked like. You could hate your neighbor as much as you wanted, as long as you were civil and decent to him when you met him on the street. That type of morality was the thing upon which they built their hopes for God's favor and for everlasting life in his presence. The spirit of Phariseeism saw only no reason to look for a savior because it did not need the pardon which that savior could and did bring. Jesus oftentimes had tried to show Jerusalem how imperfect and unacceptable her life and her words and works were. But Jerusalem only listened. She did not hear. They rejected the reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ. No wonder he cried. Such stubborn unbelief on the part of sinners who so desperately needed Jesus and his only salvation would bring its own reward, of course. And that was the total physical destruction of the city and of its people. Soon the walls would lie in ruins. Every home a shambles. The temple would be no more. And the people would be dead. Again, no wonder Jesus' eyes overflowed with tears. And in this connection, it is not at all difficult for us <clears throat> to focus our thinking on our great cities of today. Our cities like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Milwaukee. Our cities are beautiful in many ways. They have tremendous advantages over many others. They stride ahead progressively in the fields of the arts and sciences and in all learning. They have the ability, it seems, to provide not only the necessities, but also great luxuries for their people. But most of all, I believe that their advantage is in this, that they have the glorious opportunity to learn to know religious truth. And I oftentimes wonder whether or not our Savior would be pleased with our great cities of today. I believe that they would bring more bitter tears to his eyes. Why? Well, here in Milwaukee, for example, we have hundreds of churches, and thousands of people use their facilities week after week. And yet, much of our life here centers in the spirit of pride and in the spirit of selfishness and self-sufficiency. Even in our church life, we find a contamination of that spirit of the Pharisee. We so often practice the forms of religion and still our hearts are stony and cold and our lives certainly do not reflect the hope and the favor in which we stand before the Lord our God. Isn't it true that today our cities still reject just as firmly, if even though a bit more politely than in years ago, they still reject the words and the works of our only Savior, Jesus Christ. 35,000 people will pay dearly seven nights in a row to 
attend some great sporting event at the county stadium, and yet how many of those same people will attend the work of the church, the preaching of the gospel? How many will take their place as instruments of God in his purpose in the life of man today? The sad thing about it all, my friends, is simply this, that people are no longer fully conscious of their deepest soul need. People no longer seem to realize that the one thing that satisfies is pardon, the assurance of God's promises for this life and for the life to come. The Lord's offer today to give us peace of mind and that real assurance for confident living is oftentimes turned aside. It's rejected indifferently. We close our eyes to him and we close our ears and we are lost. And that's why I believe, my friend, that the tears of Jesus flow even today as he looks upon our great cities. But we ask why this sad state of affairs? How did old Jerusalem become so callous that it rejected Christ? The second verse of our text here gives us the answer, at least in greatest part. It's it says, And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought. Here is the other reason, I am sure, for Jesus' tears. The temple of his day had degenerated to a point where it no longer was what God intended it to be, a house of worship and a house of prayer. Why was Jerusalem in a bad way spiritually? Because the church of its day had broken down. My friends, today we have the same answer if we ask why are our great cities still indifferent and cold to the appeal of the Savior's gospel. Simply because much of our church life today has been misdirected. Many of our church bodies today have veered off of their course. They've lost their chart and their compass as it is given to them in the word of God. The temptation essential and popular to increase in numbers and receipts to make the church a community fraternity of unlike religious opinions and convictions. All of these things weaken and eventually destroy the fiber of truth which every church that calls itself Christian ought to cultivate and promote. And friend, if the church no longer fills her purpose, what can we expect of our people? Therefore, may God be gracious to us in this modern day. May he make you and me strong in knowledge and in faith and in loyalty to his word and cause, so that the tears of Jesus may be dried as he sees more and more sinners going into the kingdom of heaven by faith in him. Amen.